Hello, everybody. Now oh, there you go, the mic's on. Good to know. Yay. How are you all feeling today? Yay. Yay. You guys ready to talk about some spaceships? <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, some of you guys care about spaceships. We do, too. Uh, my name is CCP Fozzie. And I'm CCP Rise. Yeah, and we've got a little presentation for you today talking about uh, ship balancing and module balancing. So uh, I'm going to go through quickly the sort of themes we're going to be hitting today and what we're going to talk about. First, going to do a quick blurb talking about why we balance, the philosophy behind it, um, get kind of that uh, high-level discussion. Talk a little bit about the year in review, what's happened since we last met here on this stage uh, for the same, same type of presentation. Uh, what we've got coming up in our summer release and uh, in the future beyond it in the next couple steps. Uh, and then we're also going to be giving you a little peek into what we've got coming up for modules, a concept of module tier aside, something we've been working on the, uh, the general plan for for a while with a task force at the office. And we'll go through uh, that and give you guys an idea of what you should expect for modules over the uh, next several releases. And then we're going to have time for some question and answer. Um, I don't know how much time, probably not a ton here, but if you don't have time to ask your question here, we have two round tables on chip balancing and module balancing. They're both in the AMR room, it's downstairs over there, and uh, they're going to be uh, times and stuff on the screen now, and we'll have them up again at the end, and they're all in your schedule. And if you see us walking around, feel free to come and hassle us about balance stuff yes. as well, of course. We know you will, and we love you for it. <laughs> All right, so first I'm going to just do a quick talk, a little bit about why, we, why balance. Why is this something that we focus a lot more on over the past couple of years than we have in some of the previous years? Uh, what are the, the benefits we get from it? Uh, a little bit about the kind of the team and how we work on it. Uh, one of the big reasons is that we want to make sure that there's a wide variety of ships and modules you can use in the game to give you good choice both in building them uh, for industry people and who, how they're manufacturing ships, and also for flying them. We want to make sure that your choice of what ship to fly is never all that easy one. It's always an interesting choice to make. Uh, we want to always be uh, shaking up the combat meta a little bit. Uh, when you, ever you shake something like this up, you give an opportunity for the uh, cleverest of pilots to uh, rise to the top to demonstrate how they can come up with the newest tactics faster than everyone else. Everyone will then move and copy them, but as long as we keep shaking things up, it always allows opportunities for uh, pilots to really show their mastery to everyone else. And that's a big thing in, for any MMO, is the ability to uh, be recognized for your skill. We also want to make sure that uh, different tactics and systems are not going to be uh, ruining the gameplay for everyone. Uh, things get too powerful and you end up with the same thing all the time. Uh, some of you guys may have noticed uh, sentries uh, being used very heavily in NullSec recently, and so we made some tweaks to uh, bring that down, and this is this, that's the reason here. Uh, we want to make sure that no tactic starts actually just making the gameplay worse for everyone else from being too ubiquitous. And also, because balancing is very time and resource efficient. Um, this is always an interesting thing to talk about because it's easy to sound lazy, um, but what's important to remember is that, as all co like all companies, we do have limited resources, and it's important for us to steward that time e efficiently and responsibly because really that time is what we have to give you guys the best game possible. And it's our responsibility to make sure that we're using it the, in the most efficient way possible. And one of the really efficient ways to use time is on uh, ship and module balancing. Um, really, the ship and module balancing team it's nowadays about one full-time developer worth of time, I think. Both Rise and myself spend about half of our time on it. And from that, you're getting out, of course, you guys have seen a lot of content that comes out in every patch because uh, we're from a very relatively small amount of uh, resources put into it. And that frees up other resources to do things like the amazing industry changes that we uh, put out dev blogs about and that uh, you guys will be hearing more about at the keynotes. Yeah, and just to highlight, I mean, a bit that, mm -hmm. Uh, sometimes we see the impression that there's a huge cost to doing this, that we're choosing balance over some other feature that's more important, and often that's not the case. One of the great things about balance work is we can do it alongside other stuff, big stuff, without having a huge impact on the project overall. Yep. So I'm quickly going to go through uh, just very briefly uh, what's gone on over the last year. We'll give you some high-level uh, notes on that. I, a lot of you guys have been with us the whole time and know this, uh, but it's good to get a reminder of what's happened since we last had this presentation in FanFest. Uh, since then, we released the Odyssey expansion. 
uh, with a whole bunch of ships rebalanced are Navy frigates, Navy cruisers, attack battle cruisers, uh, Navy battle cruisers, battleships, Navy battleships, destroyer skill changes in battle cruisers, cruise missiles, lasers, <laughs> a, a gigantic list of things that uh, got changed at Odyssey. Um, some really, really big, uh, uh, big changes that had a big impact on the game, especially the battleship changes. Mm -hmm. uh, from there, we went into uh, some of the Odyssey uh, point releases. Another, oops, I was blocking with my hand, there you go. Another big set of uh, ships rebalanced, uh, in this case, highlights of industrial ships and hacks, command ships, gang links. And uh, there's a lot in there that we're going to be continuing to work on, especially uh, things like the gang links as our technology opens up for it. And then we had the Rubicon expansion at the end of last year. Uh, and in its point releases, we introduced uh, the new ships of the uh, Sisters of Eve line, uh, warp speed changes, interceptors, EAFs, marauders, a whole lot of really big changes. Uh, we also introduced um, big changes to rapid missile launchers, uh, mm -hmm. rapid lights, uh, in introduced rapid heavies. And yeah, uh, it was really cool to watch that as an example of some of the ways that we made changes and kind of reacted to the results. Yeah, rapid uh, missile launchers, of course, constantly the bane of my balancing <laughs> career. But I uh, thought you guys might be interested to see uh, actually some stats related to them because there's been a lot of conversation about them in general. This is PvP damage by week, I believe, for rapid, yep. uh, li rapid light missile launchers. Uh, on the timeline you can see below, when we changed them in Rubicon 1.0, they dropped off a little bit, um, and we made another little tweak, actually a pretty small one, and you can see they bounced right back, and they're actually headed uh, over, they're actually over where they were before we touched them at all, and they're uh, looking like they're going to keep going up. That's kind of interesting. Uh, there's a lot you can kind of read into this. Uh, I think one really big likelihood is that the new prevalence of interceptors has actually uh, kind of added a lot of new demand for rapid light missile launchers. But this is a, an interesting uh, weapon system for us, and we're going to keep looking at it and trying to figure out exactly kind of uh, how players are using it and what's fun about it and what's not fun about it. And yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, now we're just going to go through a little bit uh, about, you know, kind of in more depth, what we have coming up for our summer release. We've got a couple of reveals. Uh, we're going to talk a bit about what we are, guys already know if you've been following the forums. Uh, we've also got a couple of new things we're going to be showing you. There's also going to be some things that we're going to be saving until the keynote tomorrow night. So just so you know, we're not actually going to let you know everything at this presentation. There are some things that are going to be saved, but we are going to let you know about a couple of things that uh, you won't know about, including a few new ships. Uh, but uh, you want to do the beginning of this? Yeah, sure. So looks like this is about pirate faction stuff, I guess. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> uh, I'll throw the whole uh, set of Serpenta stuff up to begin with while we, while we talk about it. But um, where are we doing all the pirate faction stuff coming up in this uh, new release? Uh, all five of the older pirate factions, Sisters of Eve, more or less staying the same for right now. But um, before I get into the specifics of each ship, I just uh, kind of talk about the journey we went through with rebalancing them overall. Um, Pirate Factions had a lot of different things going on. Coming into the rebalance, we were worried about some situations of things being overpowered. Um, we were mostly concerned with just making sure everything was up to snuff following a lot of the Tech 1 rebalance, making sure everything was kind of up to date. These ships hadn't been visited in quite a while. And there was a couple um, ships that were in real trouble. And uh, we wanted to make sure that they were getting used and, and that they were as fun as the rest of the Pirate Faction ships. And as we started to look at them, um, with kind of Serpentis as a, a guiding uh, light for us, we realized that there's this thing with pirate factions where they really get to kind of break the rules. They're, um, they're kind of niche in some ways, but they're also broadly very powerful. But often they get to do something that there's no other, uh, at least Tech 1 Empire ships get to do, and sometimes completely unique. And we really like that, and it seemed like you guys really like that. And so we tried to focus on that a lot uh, while we were rebalancing each line. So like I said, with Serpentis as a guideline, they of course have the uh, web bonus, which you know, there's probably some division on opinion about. Um, but we really realized kind of how important this type of bonus was when I casually mentioned in a Reddit AMA a while back that we might change it and got a lot of feedback, which is great. And uh, so we talked about it a lot <coughs> and, and wanted to try and keep it there. So for now, Serpentis are keeping their web bonus. We're still kind of in feedback stage and, and uh, talking about it a bit, but uh, we want to try and keep it. I think having these really powerful bonuses that um, have some significant drawbacks alongside them so that they kind of are kept in check um, can be really, really fun. And so uh, for this line, not, there's not a lot of huge changes, especially with the Vindicator and the Daredevil. They're both performing extremely well. The Vigilant uh, had a lot of room to improve, so it's getting a lot faster. Um, 
some other little tweaks and, and keeping the bonuses the same. So like I said, this is, a, this is a successful one that won't be changing a whole lot. So let's move on. Blood Raiders were definitely one of the most complicated. They uh, have this ship, which is, I think, very well liked, has a very powerful application that everyone can appreciate, even though it actually doesn't get used all that much by volume. Um, but it's a ship we really are happy with. Then we have these two ships, which actually don't get used at all by anyone, ever. <laughs> <coughs> and we didn't like that. Um, but figuring out how to tie it all together wasn't an easy task. The uh, bonuses the Balgorn has kind of work. Uh, they don't necessarily work together as well on the smaller ships. Um, that's a lot of the feedback we got on the crew or is that having web range combined with newt power is kind of hard to make work. But um, the flavor is so strong with the race line um, from the Balgorn that we did extend that down and just tried to make the ships powerful enough by giving them some extra drones, giving them extra speed that they can compete, and then people can choose which of those bonuses to take advantage of. Um, along with that, we felt the whole line could stand with a big improvement and a new way of kind of breaking the rules. So all of these ships, uh, after the summer release, will um, use an old NOS mechanic rather than the new one. Whenever they use energy vampires, uh, they will succeed regardless of how much cap you have and how much your opponent has, which is... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Should be really interesting. I mean, we you know, changed that originally because it was really OP, so we'll see what happens uh, with these guys. <laughs> um, Garistas, another uh, big topic, um, had kind of the same issues. The Rattlesnake did get use uh, in PvE especially, but it wasn't really performing as well as we wanted. Um, the Gila had a really strong place right until we made the Ishtar really strong, and then it started to fall out of favor, and the Worm has kind of struggled for a really long time. So we wanted something to sort of boost the whole line as a whole, make them a lot of fun at the same time. And one thing we talked about was um, we wanted them to have more drones. We liked the idea of them having, like, tons of drones. So we originally were talking about, like, oh, they'll have 10 drones from the Worm. That'll be cool. Or the Worm will have medium drones or something, like some really in-your-face uh, drone bonus. And the way we ended up figuring out we could implement that um, without literally having tons of drones, since that's bad for servers, is to um, give them giant bonuses. So now Garistas have the toughest drones around. They have uh, like huge HP and damage bonuses, so they're really hard to kill those drones, but they only get a couple. Worm and Gila are also now the only two ships uh, that I know of to get light and medium drone bonuses specifically, which is interesting. It means uh, the Gila has really, really powerful medium drones, but the light drones aren't as great. And that's kind of an interesting, and same with the Rattlesnake, getting a heavy and sentry drone bonus specifically, so the smaller drones um, aren't as powerful. Also giving them a big missile bonus on top, so they just do a ton of damage now, and they should be a lot better than they were. Sanchez um, had a nightmare that was pretty popular in PvE, and that's good. Um, we wanted to make sure not to mess with that. Uh, a lot of the things we kind of talked about doing to give this race its, its flavor, its faction, sorry, its uh, like strong pirate faction flavor, would have messed with the nightmare's current application. We didn't really want to do that. We know people... Um, don't like having their ships kind of pulled out from under them, and if we can avoid it, we try to. Um, but then we had the same situation we did with Blood Raiders, where these two ships really got no use at all. They were very weak. And uh, so what we ended up figuring out we could do is we're giving this 100% uh, bonus uh, from Afterburners uh, to all three. Thank you. Thank you, that guy. That guy appreciates it. <laughs> um, which is really cool. It basically means these ships go micro-warp speed, um, with normal afterburners or close to it, and then go incredibly fast with oversized afterburners. And the whole time can't be scrammed. So you have a succubus that has you know, a, a lot of uh, potential speed, um, and it's really hard to pin down, so it should make a pretty interesting like, scram range kiter. Phantasm, I'm really curious to see what people do. It's a ship where I don't feel like we want to predict exactly how it's going to play Whatever out. Whatever it does, it's going to be broken. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> and then the nightmare remains relatively in the same place it was, so that's hopefully going to work out great. And finally, Angels, which um, this is one of those factions that when we talked about it in the past, kind of our leading up discussion had always been that this was the OP pirate faction. They always have been more popular than the others. The Macario's popular, both in PvE and in PvP. Um, the Cinnabal had at least a time where it was one of the most powerful ships uh, at this scale for skirmishing. Vagabond buffs, of course, pushed that out a little bit. And the Dreamials had, you know, it stays in the sun and not. But they've always been really powerful, all three of them. And so we came in kind of thinking we might need to tone them down. And then we talked to the players, and they said, no, just kidding, you should buff them all. And so now <laughs> they're all um, pretty close to how they were, little tweaks here and there, uh, you know, toning the fitting on the Cinnaball down just a bit because it was kind of out of control, uh, some other little things like that, but giving all three a bonus to warp speed. So your Macario can now move around faster than other battleships. Um, your Dramiel now moves around like an interceptor, and 
So thank you, that guy. There's like one Sancho pilot and one Macaro. That's good. <laughs> Anyway, this is all extremely exciting. Um, can't wait to, to get it to you guys. And there's feedback threads up now if you want specifics for any of this stuff. Mm -hmm. So go check those out. And yeah, give it back to Josh. So another uh, big class of ships that we're doing a rebalance pass on for the summer that we've talked to you guys a little bit about already are the mining barges and exhumers. Uh, yeah, there we go. <laughs> now we've got some miners in here, right? Yeah. <laughs> Also, people that will be enjoying the battle skiff afterwards, uh, because that, that <laughs> ship is, can now mine and just bash skulls uh, both equally well. Uh, so uh, with these ships, uh, about, a, what is it now, two years ago? Yeah, two years ago in Inferno, um, we went and uh, completely redid the, the roles of these ships as one of the first steps in that, what was it then, early uh, tier aside program. So these were one of the first sets of ships that got tier sided. The idea being that we wanted to make sure that instead of it just being, oh, you train until you can get in the coverter and then you're, you only use the coverter forever. Uh, you gave each ship a special role so that uh, you gave players choice. Players had the ability to choose higher tank, higher cargo hold, or uh, higher yield. And uh, overall, that was an extremely positive change. Uh, it gave a lot of great new options. Um, there was a few things in the balance that honestly didn't go perfect with that. We had uh, probably too much, uh, or we underestimated how much emphasis all of you players will put on the cargo hold. And so we had a lot of people moving to the retriever and the Mackinac. Uh, so we wanted to make sure to do another pass on it. I'm gonna actually show you a bit of a stat here. There. Oh, no, nope. one more. There we are. So this is over the past uh, 90 days, uh, a pie chart of uh, what uh, people were mining in if they were mining in barges and consumers, which is the vast majority. Like the venture is after this, but it's much smaller in volume. Um, and as you see there, uh, the uh, Mackinac and the Retriever absolutely dominate. 37% uh, and 29%, uh, then the Hulk at 17 behind that. Uh, so we wanted to make sure that uh, every ship was not only just a option, but a pretty good option rather than all being sort of subpar versions of the Retriever and the Mackinac. And uh, so what we decided to do was just emphasize the roles more heavily. Uh, the Retriever and the Mackinac are getting uh, essentially the same core role intact. Uh, the uh, yield pulled back a little bit. The Coveter and the Hulk were both increasing their yield, so you can mine even uh, more at the high end. And uh, we're also um, giving them a new bonus to mining laser range, uh, as well as allowing now the uh, gang links that already improve your mining laser range to also improve your survey scanner range, so you can actually survey scan out to your max range. <laughs> And we're really happy with uh, the feedback we got. Uh, we had put out an initial set of um, changes to these. Uh, we got a lot of great feedback, including things about the um, mining laser range gang length, and we fixed that. We also uh, got a lot of feedback about the difficulty on, in a small cargo hold ship like the Coveter and the Hulk of using different crystals if you have a mining field with a lot of different uh, ores in it. And so we're cutting the um, volume of all mining uh, crystals by 60% as well to make sure that you can actually carry them and have the ability to switch between ores much more quickly. So <laughs> the set of uh, mining barges and zoomers that got the biggest changes by far are those tanky ones, the Procure and the Skiff. Um, the tank on them was already great, and they're a really great choice, especially if you're in high sec in danger of being suicide ganked. Um, also, if you're in a more dangerous space and you want the ability to call in friends to help you out. We have seen cases, that, amazing cases, already of people just fighting off an entire Black Ops fleet with a group of skiffs. There's a guy in the drone regions that just like wiped a bunch of Black Ops battleships and recons <laughs> with his uh, skiffs. And uh, I thought that was amazing. And so what we decided to do was allow you to do that much more effectively. <laughs> <laughs> so now, both the Procurer and the Skiff are gonna have drone damage bonuses, as well as their mining bonuses. <laughs> This means that uh, if you're especially in areas where Concord isn't protecting you and you come under attack, not only do you have the hit points of a battleship, but you can actually punch back. And uh, I, we think that's gonna create some really new, great new dynamics in uh, mining in dangerous space, especially in groups. 
uh, in that you don't necessarily need to have now people defending your mining fleet who wouldn't be doing anything if you're not under attack. You can actually have ships that are mining and then can also be defending you at the same time. Uh, we're also making other improvements to the, to, the, to the yield is going up mainly through an extra low slot in the skiff. And uh, the procurer is having its speed increased quite a bit, uh, up to similar levels of the skiff, actually. Uh, that's going to be a really big benefit, especially for people that want a good way to counter uh, bumping. We d think bumping is a, very, is a great mechanic that people have just kind of used EVE mechanics for their own uh, creative ends. But we also want to make sure that there's good counters to everything. And the procurer and the skiff are fast enough that it's going to be, and tanky enough, that uh, you have that option to make yourself much harder to mess with if you want, while making other sacrifices, of course, less uh, or hold a bit less yield. And yet miners will still complain. <laughs> that's, that's the nature of it. Uh, complaining, if, if you guys stopped complaining, we'd all uh, like think that we've gone deaf and just like panic. It'd be fine. <laughs> Mina. All right, so I'm also going to talk a little bit about another set of balance changes that we've already announced and talked a bit about uh, that we've been getting some really great feedback on, and that's the drone rebalance. Um, drones. They really started out in EVE as intended to be a secondary system, uh, something that people would have on, kind of on the side, and we'll just throw 10 drones onto everything. It'll be fine. It won't cause any lag. And um, <laughs> they, they were never really intended to be the primary system very much. Um, and so there were some things that reflected that. The skills uh, to increase their power were, had very steep curves, so that it, you were actually very very ineffective with them as a new player, but then became much more effective with them later. Um, they just didn't have the same kind of benefits of modules that uh, bonus them of uh, support skills, things like that. Um, and so what we've been doing slowly over time is uh, adding to those things that are missing as much as possible. Uh, we've added uh, the drone damage amplifiers uh, years ago, and we've been continuing to add new uh, upgrades to drones. Um, in our summer release, well, actually, I'm going to show you this first. This is a... Uh, chart that we've already put into a dev blog, but if anyone hasn't seen it, it uh, might be a bit hard to read there. But that is the uh, number of shots fired in both PvP and PvE by combat drones of the four races. Uh, the tall one there is Galente, and then you have Mimitar, and then those ones that you have to squint for, that's Amar and Kaldari. Uh, <laughs> part of the <clears throat> other problems with, drone, with the fact that drones didn't have that attention for so long is that two of the factions of drones, the Amar and Kaldari ones, essentially languished as middle grounds that didn't do very well. And then the Amar ones were just bad at everything, which I don't know exactly how that got into that place in the first <laughs> place. Um, so what we're doing is going through, uh, fixing up the balance between the different factions of drones, fixing up the balance between the uh, different meta levels of drones, between tech one, tech two, faction, augmented, integrated, uh, getting all of these into a place where they're useful um, and where building them is useful. Uh, we're going to be giving them all, every uh, faction, their own kind of specializations uh, all along a chart of more damage and less speed. I'm actually uh, going to give you some hints or some discussion a bit about something that we haven't posted yet in this thread. Part of uh, your feedback on this is that uh, the middle there, the color and the ammo, that we didn't do enough to pull these guys out and make them useful. Um, and we've actually been working really hard on responding to that feedback. And uh, coming up next week, I'm going to be posting a new set of tweaks, the upgrades to this uh, set of changes in the thread to get, and updating the dev blog to get your feedback on that. Uh, but in the meantime, I can let you know, one of the things we're going to be doing is uh, pulling the drone, giving the drones a, bit, a lot more range, moving their orbit range out, which will have the effect of making it a lot less likely for them to out-track themselves, which is a problem with drone, combat drones, where they orbit too quickly to actually hit a stationary target. Um, so that'll be much less of a problem. But the other thing that allows us to do is give a new dimension of difference between the different uh, factions of drones. And what we'll be getting out of that is the Kaldari and Amar drones, the normal combat drones, not just the center, are going to have better range than the Galente and Mimitar drones and will orbit it a bit further out. Um, that's actually in practice going to mean that if you're using those guys against uh, less quickly moving targets, they will track a lot better. So against a smaller but slower target, you might want to use Kaldari MR. Against a faster but larger SIG rate, it's like an MWD in target, you might prefer Galente or Mimitar. And so that's going to be another uh, way that you can make a decision about which uh, factions worth of drones to use that we think will be very, very helpful to players.
<laughs> and we're also making a lot of big changes to the uh, skills involved with drones. Um, the skills, yeah. like I said, they really uh, penalize new players a lot. Yeah, I mean, we had drone interfacing, which gives 20% damage per level. That's a pretty big barrier. And so we're lowering that to 10% per level and then rolling the uh, damage that we took from the skill into the drones themselves. Yeah, wait for the, everyone gets the same damage. It's just <laughs> you get it for free now instead of with the skill. <laughs> Um, the other big things we're doing are the uh, former scout drone operation and advanced elect or electronic warfare drone interfacing, which actually the skill affected the range you could control drones at. We're naming those drone avionics and advanced drone avionics so that you can actually understand the connection. I think when we put the ISIS in, like that day we saw you know, 40,000 people trained electronic warfare drone interfacing because nobody knew it actually did something useful. Mm -hmm. um, and then kind of related to the Greece, those changes, we uh, wanted to split off the um, scout drone operation anyway to get a light drone operation and medium drone operation so that we can bonus those individually and so that you can train those individually. And that all just makes a lot more sense. So that should be a lot nicer after. Yeah. Really so at the end of the day, the, the skills for drones are going to be, in a lot of ways, a lot more like the skills for other weapon right. systems. Right. Yeah, they'll have the same kind of bit, like understandable progression. Uh, so now uh, we've gone over a bit of stuff that we've already talked to you guys a little bit about. Uh, let's talk about something that we haven't shown you guys yet. And that's uh, another uh, ship that we're going to be making some very significant balance changes to. It's one of the ships that we've had requests to rebalance for a long time. We've already made some tweaks to it in recent patches, uh, but this is definitely the biggest set of changes we've ever made to it. And that's the Phoenix Dreadnought. <laughs> So the Phoenix, as well as the Citadel missiles in general, have had a lot of problems over the years. Uh, we've been improving them bit by bit. Uh, they have, one of the main issues of them right now is that they have a really, really hard time hitting moving targets, uh, to the point where if you just get like up to half speed in a carrier, you are speed tanking that damage really well. Um, and so we wanted to make sure that they could apply their damage in a more sane way. Um, we also wanted to make sure that the ship felt unique, that it didn't just feel like it was stepping all over the other dreadnoughts uh, and just kind of overlapping in its role. And uh, we wanted to make sure we did it all without turning them into some kind of new blap dread juggernaut that would destroy everything and dominate the universe and all that. We don't <laughs> want your interceptors to just suddenly all die all at once to phoenixes. <laughs> at least unless you're really creative with the fit-in. And so some of the changes we're going to be making to it uh, and to the launchers in general. Uh, so the big one, we're giving the Phoenix a shield resistance bonus to replace the kinetic damage bonus. We're taking the damage that it loses in the kinetic damage bonus and putting that into the launchers themselves by improving their rate of fire. So the alpha will go down a bit, but the damage is actually going to go up we're, uh, for uh, torps and it'll stay about the same for cruises. And that means that the Phoenix not only gets the resistance bonus, but also now gets fully damage selectable uh, damage. So it can equally deal damage in any of the four damage types. Be able to choose whatever is best for knocking down posses, whatever is best for who you're shooting. We're also going to be drastically increasing the velocity of all Citadel missiles. It's like, uh, I forget what we're doing for, like it's 30 something, I think, percent for cruises, but it's 100 percent. We're just doubling the speed of Citadel torps because they took forever. And if you have, if you can like go out and get a snack while your missiles are on their way, then it's bad. <laughs> Um, and we're, the big thing we're doing for applying damage, this is uh, something that's a bit complicated to explain, but uh, we'll talk about it a bit more in the forum post that'll be coming out early next week after, once we've gotten over the hangovers. Uh, we're going to be actually uh, removing some of the explosion radius from the missiles, and, but giving them a lot more explosion velocity. Uh, in practice, that means that it'll be a lot harder for a ship like a, a carrier or other uh, capital ship to speed tank the missiles. Of course, you'll still be able to speed tank it in smaller sh ships, just as you should. Um, but that it also won't be too much better at knocking down um, small ships. It is going to get a little bit better at applying damage to small ships, but the biggest differences are going to be when you're shooting uh, ships moving in that like 50, 50 meters a second to 100 meters a second range, as you often see with capital ships. Um, the uh, pr other practical upshot of this, uh, to make it work, we're actually increasing the signature radius of every POS structure in the game and uh, POSs, because uh, that means it'll still be do full damage to it. But we're <laughs> going through and making sure that this is going to work on everything else involved. Uh, but at the end of the day, this is going to mean much saner damage application. It will apply the damage in a much more logical way. 
so at this point, after the uh, summer release, the Phoenix is now going to have its own niche as a uh, ship that can deal quite good damage, uh, deal it at pretty flexible ranges, uh, similar, more, more similar to the Revelation than to the Moros, and do it uh, with damage selection and with a really great tank and capital weapons. It's going to actually be, in a lot of ways, a kind of heavier tank version of the Naglifer instead of trying to compete with the uh, Moros directly. And I think that's going to be a really, uh, really competitive niche for it. <laughs> so um, we are also going to be making a couple tweaks to the Leviathan to make sure this doesn't make it super powerful, but we'll go to that details. Th we're not doing a full rebalance on the Leviathan, just on the Phoenix at this point. <clears throat> um, I'm also now going to go through a little bit uh, of a couple of new ships we're introducing. So there was a uh, forum thread discussing something that we mentioned on the live stream coming in, uh, approaching this, uh, where we said we're going to be uh, introducing uh, some new ships. Um, I clarified there's going to be uh, one set of ships that's uh, really cool but fairly low impact to most people, uh, one set of ships that's an upgrade or advanced version of one of the most popular ships, and one set that fills a void that we've been trying to fill for a while. We're going to be showing you the first of those categories today, uh, and then the rest will be at the keynote tomorrow. So you'll have to wait a little bit for the, for the rest of the reveals. But first I'm going to talk to you a little bit about, about two ships. A lot of you guys have guessed what they are. And that's what's going to be coming up for the Alliance Tournament 12 ships. Uh, these are always uh, very fun ships to design because we get to do some pretty cool things with them, uh, even though I know fewer people get to fly with them. But I definitely think you guys will enjoy both watching the tournament and uh, being aware of just how amazingly trolly these ships are. I love it so much. <laughs> so you're going to be hearing a lot about the Garistas uh, at this fan fest because this is a good time for the Garistas right now at EVE. They are uh, doing pretty well. Uh, they're in a pretty strong place and they're coming up with some really cool stuff. And uh, so they have decided actually to sponsor this Alliance tournament. And uh, in true pirate fashion, they have decided to uh, create some ships that they know are going to annoy the most people possible. Uh, so this is the, I'm going to show you right now is the description of the, uh, the cruiser uh, that's going to be sitting uh, in its show info tab. <laughs> so the, uh, we are going to be seeing a new Pirate Faction Alliance Tournament version uh, it's going to be a combination of the Falcon and the new Gila, basically. Yes, oh it'll be Covert Ops cloaking. <laughs> it will have ECM bonuses and a shield resistance bonus and drone damage. <laughs> this is, uh, you don't need to go through the whole list, but yes, mm -hmm. the, it's a pretty ridiculous ship. We'll be making some forum posts about it in a bit. <laughs> <laughs> We're also going to be introducing the second place prize, which is a uh, Garista's interceptor called the Whiptail. This baby is a interceptor that has all the benefits of the worm, basically. Uh, we'll do uh, kinetic and thermal missile damage, half shield resistance. And, uh, oh, by, actually, I didn't write it on there, but it's an interceptor, so yes, it is immune to bubbles. And uh, we think people are going to, uh, whoever, so this is, this is your uh, warning. You should start training right now. If you want to win the Alliance tournament or get second place and get one of these guys, uh, there's going to be a lot, uh, a lot of people, I think, trying to get a hold of those. <laughs> yeah. So now I'm going to move into talking a little bit about uh, the kind of things that we have on deck. So actually, I want to clarify that we haven't actually covered everything in balance that's going into our summer release, because there is some stuff that we're saving to reveal uh, in the keynote tomorrow. So we'll talk a bit more about that tomorrow. But in the meantime, I want to skip to some of the stuff that we have kind of on deck, some of the things we are planning on working on in the near future. Uh, that we're going to be getting to basically kind of next uh, and talk a little bit about what our goals for them are. Uh, so one set that we want to work on is the larger of the support ships for uh, mining, uh, the Orca and the Rorqual. 
Uh, the Orca doesn't actually need nearly as much help. It's got a pretty good role. Uh, it's going to be a, probably a smaller set of changes. Uh, the Rorqual, on the other hand, we are uh, very aware of how in dire need of help it is. Uh, we're at the moment in the summer release going to be taking, well, keep, it's going to keep its compression feature, uh, but it's, that's going to be now shared with a, a star based structure. So that's no longer going to be fully unique to it. Uh, it's always a ship that. Uh, has kind of languished as it's got the bonuses for um, uh, tractor beams, but then you never put it in the belt because that would be silly. Uh, it's got the uh, uh, gangling bonuses, but it kind of also needs to be inside of force fields, which is why we uh, gave it or gave the mining uh, links the exception when we removed all, mine, or all gang links from force fields. So the goal here will be to make a ship that is the kind of thing that you want to put into a belt. Uh, with extremely strong defensive bonuses and the ability to not only protect itself but its friends, uh, and the ability to uh, also provide a strong benefit to your, um, uh, to your mining fleet. Uh, get these things out where they're in, a bit in some danger, but also where that danger is manageable, where they're, it's actually sane to put them into that danger. Uh, so more details of what we're thinking of for that will be coming in the future. We're still at kind of an earlier stage with that. That's not going to be coming out in the summer release, but uh, it's one of the things we're thinking very heavily about and uh, planning on getting to basically next. Another set of ships that we uh, have on deck is the Stealth Bombers. Uh, so these are some of my favorite ships in the game. I really like the, uh, the gameplay that they provide. I love the fact that they provide gameplay that's completely different than other gameplay. And we've talked about this before internally, uh, that we really we want to introduce actually more mechanics that um, are you know, like stealth bombers in that they provide you with a whole new way of playing Eve, rather than just, well, let's like, make it a different ship for pressing F1, uh, make a ship that uh, actually gives you a whole new way to play it. Bombers did that very effectively. Um, they're also now getting to the point where they are feeling very oppressive, I know, for a lot of people in Nullsec. Uh, so what we want to make sure is that bombers are ships that are both fun to use. Uh, they provide you benefits for mastery so that a good bomber pilot is noticeably different than a bad bomber pilot. And, so the, and make sure that there's always good countermeasures for deal, dealing with them too. We've been chatting with the CSM about this for a while now and uh, working on some ideas with them. Uh, we'll continue working on it with the uh, upcoming new CSM that we'll be announcing on uh, Saturday night as we work with them as all of our balance changes. We really are thankful for the help that the CSM provides. And big thank you to every one of you guys that voted. If you voted, you definitely should have. It's awesome. And if you, one way or another, vote next year. Um, yes. Uh, but we are going to be uh, continuing to work with them and with you guys to uh, come up with exactly the details of the changes, but we've got some uh, stuff that already is in, in the works. Um, we're also going to be working on recon ships very soon. Uh, these are a set of tech... Yeah. Uh, a set of Tech 2 ships that are both incredibly crucial uh, for a lot of purposes. Uh, they do a great thing we like Tech 2 to do, in, where, in which they uh, do what they do the best of anyone in a lot of cases. So the Hugin is the best long-range webbing ship. Uh, the uh, Curse is the best uh, cruiser-sized long-range uh, nuding ship. Uh, these guys do what they do in a lot of cases very well. In other cases, there's the Pilgrim. And uh, <laughs> they, they do need mm -hmm. a, quite a bit of, of work. And so we actually had, um, I've got some designs that are well on their way to being uh, ready to start getting feedback on. Uh, we were, uh, came close to putting them into the uh, summer release, actually, but uh, ended up focusing more on things like the minor bar just to fit uh, with the other industry changes. But uh, there's a lot of stuff that we are working on for them, and uh, we'll be, again, working with the upcoming CSM and with you guys to uh, get these ships to the point where all of them are fun and exciting ships to fly. I think uh, cloaking ships should be some of the most exciting ships to fly in the game. That feeling that I know that I'm about to kill you, but you don't know is a really great feeling. And uh, we want to make sure that there's good choices for people who want to fly in that kind of gameplay. Uh, speaking of that and a lot of other things, uh, we also get, plan on working on strategic cruisers. So this is something uh, I know, especially you wormholers, have been uh, very nervous about for a long time. Uh, we may have sometimes uh, been guilty of uh, taunting you guys a bit too much uh, and exaggerating a little bit. But uh, yes, we are going to be working on uh, strategic cruisers. Uh, we're not going to nerf them into the ground, don't worry. 
Uh, we want to make sure that every subsystem has a good, strong role, uh, and that the shifts themselves uh, have, you, you basically have a good set of choices so that it's not just the same subsystems all the time. The strategic cruisers were a brilliant idea that the execution of has always sort of struggled a little bit. We want to make sure that these ships can actually take advantage of their flexibility in much, more strong, much stronger ways. Um, we're working on ways to make sure that rigs don't hold you back anymore. Uh, when you're uh, working with your strategic cruisers, because often you end up having to rig them and then keep that one for that exact subsystem configuration, then have to get another hull for another subsystem configuration. Um, there's a lot of things we want to do there. It, the changes will involve uh, probably reducing the power of some subsystem combinations, but the vast majority of them will be getting better because there's a lot of subsystem combinations that we know need a lot of help, and we're going to make sure that these ships are well balanced all around. <laughs> 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 yeah, very hesitant, like nervous wormholer claps. <laughs> Don't worry, we're, we're not going to take away. Maybe the, good you, news. People are still going to love to produce them. That's, that's important. Um, so let's talk a little bit now about uh, modules. This is something we've gone, talked a lot about chips uh, so far in this presentation. And we want to go over a little bit about our uh, plans that I showed you a glimpse of right at the beginning uh, for module tier aside, for essentially going through and fixing up uh, the way modules uh, progress in the game. Uh, so as you guys, I'm sure, know, we've been improving module balance uh, a lot over recent years, but usually specifically targeting certain modules that have balance issues, uh, fixing them up, um, not going with a really comprehensive, this is how meta levels need to be changed, things like that. But we're getting to the point now where that is directly in our sights. Uh, mo module meta levels need a full rework. Uh, we need to make sure that, like we did with the ships, we give you good choices for all kinds of meta levels, uh, and that uh, we make sure that every module is useful. And uh, so we're introducing a system of module tier aside. You're going to be seeing this uh, start to enter the game over upcoming releases. Uh, we've got a team that uh, we've put together internally, a module task force that's working on uh, all the details of this, but I can show you now kind of what we've reached so far in the plan and how we're going to be approaching that in the future. Uh, like ship tier aside, this is going to be an ongoing process. It's, you're not going to wake up one day and every single module is tier aside at all at once. We'll be doing it in batches, and uh, you'll see that as an ongoing improvement process over time. So let's take a look at the example of, say, the meta levels of a uh, beam laser. This is basically the way that uh, meta levels work right now. Uh, you have a power level going across there, and uh, specializations, there isn't really too much in the way of specializations for most modules. Uh, there's basically just the tech one, and then increasingly better modules that have higher cost, although the named ones end up just not working very well at all. Uh, in some cases, they end up working too well and being ahead of tech two. Tech 2, in a lot of ways, is its own specialization. They can use their own ammo in the case of guns. They have more skill requirements. They have more uh, fitting requirements. But then they get big bonuses as well on top of that. So there's something, to be, you know, something good about that. But for the most part, the uh, progression is just linear. And we don't really like to have just straight linear progression. It doesn't give you good choices. You basically just go with whatever the most expensive module you can fit. And that's actually, I know a lot of people, the way that they, they don't try to memorize the meta level names for modules. If they want to buy a named module, uh, they just go look at whichever one fits their price, like usually this is the most expensive one and assume that's going to be the best one. And uh, <laughs> we want to make sure that that choice is actually a good choice to make and a fun choice to make. So this slide it describes a little bit about what we're going to be seeing in the future once we're done with the tier aside on that module. That instead of being, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of being a direct progress, just linear progression, you will now have the ability to choose different specializations. So we'll be taking the uh, currently often called meta modules, the named modules, uh, putting them at about the same power level. Uh, but in different specializations. And that spe set of specializations will be different for every type of module. So this is an example for beam lasers. Obviously, autocannons aren't going to have the cap use one, uh, but they might have something else. Obviously, a, um, you won't see range or tracking on an armor hardener. But there, we're going to be, for each module, we'll take a look at different uh, benefits that they can give. Uh, and that will often mean fewer meta levels for some modules. A nanofiber internal structure, we're not going to have four things for it, because there isn't four things about it. Um, and uh, that means that there will be some compression there, but we're only going to give you choices that actually matter instead of a bunch of useless choices that mean nothing. And uh, so the, in this example, you can see you have tech one, 
You have the named modules, all in their own specializations. You can choose the one that fits what you want to do. Tech 2 still fills the same basic role. And then your higher meta modules also have their own specializations. And this is something that you can see an example of it working fairly well in shield boosters, uh, where you have the one line, the GIST line of lower cap use, more efficient ones, and then the PITH line where you uh, have less efficiency but more burst uh, rep. And uh, we want to be pulling those apart in all these cases. So in the example of beam lasers, you'd have, say, the Sancha ones with higher tracking. And the blood ones with, say, higher range, as an example. And、uh, you'd be able to actually choose at any meta level between two different uh, sets, uh, or in some cases, even more different sets that、uh, all have their own strengths and weaknesses. So, this is a project that, again, like I said, is not going to happen all at once.、Um, it's going to take some time. Uh, the, the task force we put together, and we've come up with a plan, but, and we're going to be starting to. Tackle some of the simpler cases of modules first, probably to test out the process. We definitely want to get your feedback on it.、Uh, we'll be working in, in concert with you guys with all the feedback you give us in the forums, through the CSM, of exactly how we're doing as we go through this process.、Um, there's also a couple other things that, especially、uh, CSP Bedic, is working very hard on、uh, for a bit further in the future. That probably won't be in the first iteration of it,、uh, which to allow people to manufacture named modules.、Uh, we really do have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We really do have a dream of someday、uh, an EVE Online where everything that any player uses is made by someone else,、uh, where everybody has an opportunity to build to,、uh, things that other people are going to use that they can use themselves,、uh, that industry is tied to absolutely everything instead of just most things. And Nate modules are definitely part of that in the future. And、uh, we, like I said, the main、uh, goal of the entire process is、uh, to give you some more choice in modules. Um, I'm now going to go over a little bit, just to let you know, a bit of a teaser.、Uh, make sure to come to the Eve keynote tomorrow. I'm sure you guys weren't going to miss it anyways. People on the stream, it's going to be streamed as well.、Uh, I'm going to show you some very quick teasers, like little bits of what you're going to be seeing.、Uh, I actually hope I don't get in too much trouble for this, but、uh, <laughs> it won't it. tell you very much. You, you don't even know I'm doing this. No. This is a little bit of one thing you'll be seeing. This is a little bit of another thing you'll be seeing. That's a little bit of another thing. And、uh, you'll have to come to the、uh, keynote <laughs> in order to get the entire images there. <laughs> oh my God.、Uh, so now、uh, we have probably not a lot of time. In fact, not any time at all, really.、Uh, so we're not going <laughs> to take questions here、uh, because we used up all of our time. But what we are going to be doing is having two full roundtables on ship、uh, and module balancing. So they're tomorrow and Saturday.、Uh, they're in roundtable room three,、um, the MR room. It's、uh, Saturday, or tomorrow at 1500, Saturday at、uh, 1600. I definitely encourage all you guys to show up to at least one of them. We're going to try to duplicate what we say in them so you don't have to all show up to all of them. They will be packed.、Uh, and like, Uh, Rise said, catch us at the、uh, pub crawl, charity dinner, and walking down the hallways. And feel free to hassle other devs you see about balance too. We talk a lot about balance, but of course, we're not the only ones that do it. CCB, Turbium, especially, super involved, and the whole team does a lot. So you know, let everyone、mm -hmm. you know,、uh, everyone you see know about balance stuff. I'm sure、yeah. they'll be happy to talk to you. <laughs> Thank you guys very much for coming. And Thanks,、uh, I really hope you enjoy the rest of、uh, today.